lecture, uh, my lecture called uh, Thorns and Roses, Approaching Difficult Theosophical History. So first, a theosophical journey. The Theosophical Society has been recognized for its efforts in the revival, occult revival, in Europe and America during the late 19th and 20th centuries, including its influence on areas such as the arts, literature, and politics. Nonetheless, society leaders also face challenges to their authenticity. Especially during the society's formative years, some of these challenges came from outside the society. But society members also questioned their own colleagues' purpose, work, and their leadership ability. I would like to discuss some neglected issues related to one of the most important periods in the history of the Theosophical Society, popularly known as the Judge Case, uh, which will be included in a study that I have recently completed. Before reviewing these issues, I would like to share with you my approach in writing about this period between 1891 and 1896 and provide a brief overview of the events themselves. After 1891, the 1891, excuse me, death of one of the society's main founders, Helena Petrovna Blavatsky, a divisive confrontation arose within the movement, provoking what I would classify as the society's own civil war. This struggle for the movement's continu continuing unity centered around three prominent leaders taking two sides. On one side stood the society's vice president and general secretary of the American section, William Kwan Judge, who believed the society's further development was being hindered by black magicians influencing uh, Brahmin members in India. On the other side stood the president of the Blavatsky Lodge in London, Annie Wood Besant, with the society's president, Henry Steele Olcott, who lived in India. Besant and Olcott became suspicious of Judge's direction for the movement's future that he claimed were inspired by adepts known as the Mahatmas associated with the movement. Among their standing titles, Besant and Judge were also appointed as co-outer heads leading the specialized Eastern School of Theosophy following Blavatsky's death. Within a few years after Besant and Judge's new appointment in the EST, Olcott and later Besant began to doubt the authenticity of Judge's Mahatmic messages. Doubts grew into accusation that Judge was forging these messages, which became the setting for the struggles that followed. Olcott provided the label that has stuck with this period to this day, the Judge case. Two earlier historians of theosophy have insightfully pointed out the importance of the Judge case for the overall movement. Alvin Boyd Kuhn wrote in what is considered to be the first academic treatment of the modern theosophical movement in the 1930s. In his study, he noted that disputes over the reception of Mahatmic messages raised by the judge case are, quote, the key to most of the controversial history of the theosophical movement. The question of alleged messages from the high ones or the masters has been the opening wedge of most of the schisms of the cult, end quote. Much later, the theosophical historian John Cooper also confirmed the challenges that emerged in the society concerning the reception of Mahatma letters by stating more specifically, quote, the judge case, which also centered on letters from the Mahatmas, is the key point to the divisions within the theosophical movement, end quote. I began hearing stories about this in related episodes during the late 1980s, stoked by the help of a good friend who had a vast collection of published and archival material on theosophy. I learned that there were, were, a, were a succession of splits within this movement, and members in the segregated groups held and can still hold today very strong feelings for their identified protagonists and antagonists based on a member's stance on the struggles within a once unified modern theosophical movement. Yet the most contentious split within the Theosophical Society also turns out to be its first, the above mentioned judge case. Over a period of time, I read and listened to different viewpoints about the conflict that typically focuses on Judge and Besant, though Olcott, who was the real inspiration for the accusations against Judge, appears throughout this narrative in his own significant way. What I eventually noticed in the majority of published histories that dealt with the Judge case was an author's unconditional support for either Judge or Besant and Olcott while identifying the opposing party as being solely responsible for the fragmentation of the society. I also became aware of significant aspects of Judge's, judges and Besant's conflicted relationship 
that were either vaguely touched upon or absent in existing renditions of the author's story. I contend that regardless of how this divisive period began, the unwavering position maintained by leading players determined their ongoing decisions that contributed to the ensuing split. Further, I also noticed that the judge case was only described within general histories of this movement, and up until recently no major study dealt exclusively with what undoubtedly remains a very controversial episode within the movement. In 2004, a major study on this period finally appeared, called The Judge Case, A Conspiracy Which Ruined the Theosophical Cause. Even at nearly 1,000 pages, this study did not satisfy my yearnings for a comprehensive review. I had been researching and writing about The Judge Case for eight years prior to this book's publication and felt that the author, Mr. Ernest Pelletier, exhibited a very specific bias concerning Judge, which was made apparent in his preface. Here, Pelletier expressed his purpose in writing his book, whose intention, he said, was to, quote, bear the facts and to present a detailed factual defense uh, to vindicate W.Q. Judge's reputation and to repudiate the accusations of fraud presented to Judge by Besant, end quote. While Pelletier felt that the charges leveled against Judge could not be proved or disproved, a position to which I would agree, he believed that Judge was nonetheless the victim of this story who was conspired against. As I noted in my review of this work in the journal Theosophical History, quote, we end up reading a rendition of this conflict that endorses Judge's ideological view. Mr. Pelletier's approach reveals much about Judge as the declared protagonist, yet this exclusive focus sacrifices other points of view, end quote. In 1989, Mr. Gregory, or excuse me, Dr. Gregory Tillett addressed the challenges encountered in narratives written by theosophical historians when their work is analyzed according to the principles of historical methodology. These principles are worth restating. They include access to primary sources, or primary or original sources, excuse me, the difficulties in using secondary sources, such as distortion or interpretation, and separating fact from fiction, recognizing partiality and bias, the standards and the methodology itself, which we like to call the levels of scholarship, the willingness to critically re-examine received histories, and an understanding a tradition esoteric or religious on its own terms. By neglecting any uh, number of these principles, Tillett commented that, quote, theosophical history, like most religious and political history, has essentially been undertaken along party lines. The heroes and villains are defined before the history is written. The party lines are maintained in spite and frequently in vigorous defiance of what secular history would call the facts." End quote. I believe that a number of narrative challenges pointed out by Dr. Tillett are still present in extant histories covering the judge case. As I began to study the judge case, it took time for me to feel competent to discuss the facts about this episode without personal or ideological bias that I found in past renditions published in one or another of the existing theosophical organizations. During the 1980s, I was exposed to theosophy from the perspective of three prominent organizations accessible in Southern California. The so-called Adyar Society, the tradition that includes Annie Besant and C.W. Leadbeater, the Pasadena Society, inheritors of Judge's legacy with Catherine Tingley and later Gottfried de Perugger, and the United Lodge of Theosophists, initially led by Robert Crosby after leaving the Point Loma Theosophical community. While this gave me a diverse view uh, of the major traditions that we call theosophy today, I spent time predominantly in the theosophical group in Los Angeles affiliated with the Adyar tradition. This lodge was a black sheep, though, among Adyar's flock, since many members supported what different sides would call the pro-judge stance in the, ju of the, in the judge case. But I wanted to do something different in writing about this period. I wanted to present this story from both Judge's and Besson's perspective without the chorus of ideological commentary. Therefore, I wanted to present the views and relationships between these two leaders and their supporters based on documents available to me and follow their interactions up to the split that eventually occurred within the society. This meant I could no longer be pro-Judge or, for that matter, pro-Besson, 
I had to be ju uh, I had to be neutral. The pro-judge perspective usually treats him as a villain of the events that, for example, may have originated from a conspiracy that Pelletier contends was meant to eliminate judges' guiding influence as much as possible from the society. At some point, Besant did want to reduce judges' influence due to her accusations that judge was forging Mahatmic messages. Whether the timing and motive for Besant's charges was part of a conspiracy is another matter to discern. On the other hand, pro Besant supporters contend that Judge had abused his leadership positions with uh, doubtful contacts with the Mahatmas, and she ultimately needed to wrest control away from Judge to stop his misguided efforts. During my research into this period, and prior to the publication of Pelletier's work, I began to read about historical methodology. In New Age religion and Western culture, the Dutch scholar of Western esotericism, Wouter Honegraaff, discusses a framework for doing empirical research in the humanities that differs from the approach taken in the natural sciences. Because the humanities deals with the scope of people's beliefs, their subjective perspectives and behavior, Hanegraaff suggests using theoretical tools to safeguard between the emic and the etic. The emic, he denotes, of what could be called the believer's point of view to study various esoteric movements which have increasingly been accepted in many humanities departments in academia. Therefore, to begin providing an accurate presentation of the subjects for historical research, an undertaking of the believer's point of view needs to be included in the research. Yet seeking to understand the subject's perspective, beliefs, or knowledge requires um, excluding the researcher's personal biases towards these discoveries as much as possible. Therefore, Honegraaff points out that representing this material may require uh, what he says, of, quote, as language, distinctions, theories, and interpretive models that are considered appropriate by scholars on their own terms, uh, end quote, outside of the believer's point of view. This perspective becomes the etic. Together, these tools used in tandem become a, a model to both understand the subject matter, yet keep an ever important critical distance in order to become as much as possible like an unvarnished mirror to present the subject matter and analyze the findings of one's research. This includes being able to distinguish, for example, a person's belief or knowledge about something apart from their feelings and again apart from their behavior. Though these areas may be uh, or can be interrelated at some point in the discussion. Additionally, the research is still responsible for the fact factual accuracy of their narrative. My goal is to tell the story of this absorbing yet difficult period in the history of the Theosophical Society without adopting the defensive apologetics that have been the hallmark of prior studies. In my upcoming study, uh, Troubled Emissaries, I hope to provide fuller context to issues and perspectives presented by theosophists in the 1890s, including some little-known aspects about this period. Before outlining a few of the issues that arose during this period, we should review the overall timeline of events in the judge case. I will do so in a manner that you might typically read in current histories of the society. So an overview of the judge case. Following the death of Madame Blavatsky, Judge and Besant each claimed to con uh, continue receiving messages from Blavatsky's adept teachers. Judge distributed messages um, excuse me, from the Mahatmas to a few members, including Besant, on issues current in the society, such as his and Besant's appointment as co-heads of the Eastern School of Theosophy, or when Besant should depart for an anticipated lecture tour in India. President Olcott also received judges' Mahatmic messages, and he became suspicious of a seal mark left on some letters. By February of 1894, Besant, based on Olcott's prior suggestion, officially accused a judge of forging the Mahatma's messages while performing his duties as the society's vice president in order to gain more control over the society's management. A hearing was scheduled in London with the society's judicial committee prior to the European section's convention in July. Besant wanted the judicial committee to hear her charges and allow judge to reply. Besant wanted the judicial committee, whoops, I'm sorry, when the committee met, excuse me, a uh, judge objected to the legitimacy of the meeting by pointing out that the society's bylaws forbade any member inquiring into the nature of another member's relationship with their spiritual teacher. In judge's case, this included his relationship with the Mahatmas and his claim to receive their messages. 
While some members were reluctant to do so, the committee agreed with judges' demurs. Besson's charges were tabled and could not be discussed by the committee. To appease dissatisfied committee members of this outcome, Besant and Judge were allowed to read their own explanations about the accusations during the European Convention at a special evening meeting. It was hoped their explanations would put an end to the matter. After the convention, it was also agreed that they should segregate their shared duties as co outer heads of the EST geographically, given their new uneasy relationship. Under their new agreement, Judge was responsible to administer the American section, and Besant served the European and Indian sections. One member dissatisfied with the Judicial Committee's outcome was Walter Ould, who was becoming a well-known astrologer in Great Britain. He gave a copy of Besson's charges and samples of Mahatmic messages collected as evidence to an acquaintance who was an editor at the London newspaper, the Westminster Gazette. A series of critical articles about the Society's controversial imbroglio were published in the fall of 1894 that reignited the simmering desire of members still wanting to, for Judge to explain how he produced his Mahatmic messages. Judge served in several leadership positions and some considered him eligible to be the next president, so a number of prominent members also wanted him to respond to their concerns. But for constitutional and occult reasons, Judge refused to give any explanation. With suspicions continuing against Judge the, and anger increasing between rising factions supporting either him or Besant, Judge issued an EST circular that, <clears throat> that he said was directed by one of the masters to explain the real reasons for Besant's attacks against him and the emerging threat against the whole society. The now famous November 3, 1894 circular revealed the society that the society's vulnerable enemies, according to Judge, the black magicians, were influencing certain Brahmins in India in order to derail the society's true work initiated by Blavatsky. Besant had been touring India prior to this circular's release, and Judge claimed that Brahmins tainted by the black magicians were also influencing her. Judge singled out one Brahmin in particular who he felt was having the most deleterious effect on her, uh, Gayanendra Chakravarti. Besant had met Chakravarti the previous year as preparations were underway for the 1893 Parliament of Religions. He described the black magicians being behind the accusations made against him to continue their attempts to disrupt the society's ongoing efforts. With Besant now considered a risk to the society's mission, Judge unilaterally dismissed her as an outer head of the EST. Judge's counter accusations directed at Besant in his circular only infuriated his one time EST co leader. Besant prepared her accusations about Judge for publication so that members could make their own decision to continue having confidence in him as a leader. She would also include a resolution that if Judge did not respond to the charges by the end of six months, he should be expelled from the society. Of the four sections in the society at that time, only a majority of members in America supported Judge with a handful of members in Great Britain, the European continent, and Australia. Judge might have faced expulsion, yet a month before this notice was published, the American section met for their annual convention in April of 1895. The American members uh, overwhelmingly, though not unanimously, voted to declare their autonomy from the society's headquarters at Adyar, India. When Olcott received this news, he saw the separation of American members as their succession from the society and canceled the American section's charter, including all the branches and individual members uh, supporting Judge. Judge's autonomous society wrote their own bylaws and elected him as, president, as their president. Judge was very ill throughout this period and he would soon die in late March the following year. He was succeeded in leadership by a woman named Catherine Tingley, whom Judge is thought to have met in early 1893, yet who is little known to most members except to a few of Judge's closest colleagues. Olcott recharted the remaining uh, members, numbering less than 300, who wished to continue as the American section with Adyar, and by the early 1900s they reestablished the American section headquarters in Wheaton, Illinois, near Chicago. So now I'm going to go into neglected issues in the, in the judge case. This brief synopsis is likely what most listeners may hear about the judge case, give or take a few details. While sifting through journals and archival materials during my research, I found elements of this story 
especially in accessible journals, which received little or no discussion in previously published narratives dealing with this period. Either the researcher did not recognize its relevance to the judge case, or they chose to ignore the material, possibly in order to avoid dealing with uncomfortable issues, or the information was decided to be irrelevant based on their perceived bias of how the story should be told. Taking Hanegraaff's historical theoretical tools of the Emic and the Etic in hand, I sought to find as many of the details about the judge case as I could and write what I hoped would be a more comprehensive story, even if this included a few thorny issues in the eyes of some readers. Therefore, I would like to present three areas, though not ex exhaustively, uh, given the time constraints of this presentation, which deserve more attention to better understand how the judge case unfolded. First, we will discuss Besson's definition of forgery and compare this to known descriptions by Blavatsky explaining how the Mahatma letters were supposed to be produced. Secondly, we will review the influence Catherine Tingley may have exerted on judges' decision-making process leading up to the society split. And lastly, we will speak about judges' claim of autonomy for the American section in contrast to Olcott's claim that judge and his supporters succeeded from the society. So first, how Besant defined forgery. Annie Besant submitted six charges against Judge in March of 1894, shortly before the Society's Judicial Committee convened in London in July of 1894. Of the six charges, the most ex uh, important accusation she made that resonated with her contemporaries and remains the exclusive focus for future generations of theosophists was the charge that Judge forged Mahatmic messages. During the European Convention, Besant described her main accusation of forgery to the delegates uh, in this way. Quote, the vital charge is that Mr. Judge has issued letters and messages in the script recognizable as that adapted by a master by whom HBB was closely connected and that these letters and messages were neither written nor precipitated by the master in whose writings they appear. Further, I wish it to be distinctly understood that I do not charge and have not charged Mr. Judge with forgery in the ordinary sense of the term, but with giving a misleading material form to messages received psychically from the master in various ways without acquainting the recipient of this fact. And lastly, she says, and that Mr. Judge has then believed himself to be justified in writing down in a script adapted by HPB the communications from the masters the me a message psychically received and in giving that person to wrongly assume that it was a direct precipitation or writing by the master himself, that is, it was, that it was done through Mr. Judge but done by the master, to end her uh, part of her quote. So Besant believed that Judge received information from a Mahatma by psychic means, which, but Judge's fault lay in not telling the recipient that the message was then composed in his own words incorporating what the master intended him to say. Additionally, and unknown to the recipient, Judge on occasion wrote his message in a simulated handwriting style of the master. Her complaint was that Judge left the impression that the message was either directly written or precipitated by uh, the master. Instead, Judge should have given the recipient the Mahatma's message in his own words without imitating the Mahatma's style of writing. At the end of her speech before the European Convention, she summarized her accusation uh, in this way. I know now that they, the messages, were not written or precipitated by the master and that they were done by Mr. Judge, but I also believe that the gist of these messages was psychically received and that Mr. Judge's heir lay in giving them to me in a script written by himself and not saying that he had done so. Besant was not giving her listeners a typical definition of forgery. She also referred to articles published by both Blavatsky and later Judge des describing the techniques used to produce paranormal communications from the Mahatmas, but she did not elaborate on what they said. While available to Besant, these articles have also been preserved today, and we can review the statements they contain about the production of Mahatmic messages. For the sake of this paper, we will limit these examinations to those given by Blavatsky. Blavatsky noted more than once that the Mahatmas usually did not write their own letters, nor is the handwriting seen on their letters always produced in the ordinary way. Instead, they typically used one or more of their chelas as an amanuensis to help produce the message and sometimes deliver it. Blavatsky described the process of transmitting a message between 
the Mahatma and another person as a form of, quote, psychic telegraphy, end quote. The success of this project depended on several factors. One was the force and clearness with which the sender's thoughts are propelled, and two, how free the receiving brain is to receive the incoming thoughts without disturbance. She said that problems can and do sometimes occur at either end, that is, either the Mahatma or the Chela lets their mind wander while sending a message, while sending, excuse me, or receiving a message. Blavatsky also had the following to say about the production of these letters. She said, thus what criterion has anyone to decide between one precipitated letter or another such letter? Uh, who accept their authors and <clears throat> those whom that employ their amanuensis, the chalas and disciples, can tell? For it is hardly one out of a hundred occult letters that is ever written by the hand of a master and in whose name and on whose behalf they are sent, as the masters have neither uh, need nor leisure to write them. And that when a master says, quote, I wrote this letter, end quote, it means that um, only that every word of it has, was dictated by him and impressed under his direct supervision. Generally, they make a chela, whether near or far away, write or precipitate them by impressing upon his mind the ideas they wish to express and, if necessary, aiding him in the picture printing process or precipitation. It depends entirely upon the chela's state of development, how accurately the ideas may be transmitted and the writing model um, imitated. Commenting further, on the that's end, end quote. Commenting further on the recipient's ability to receive the message, Blavatsky noted that during the process of thought transference used in sending some of the Mahatma letters and using herself as a recipient, the resulting letter, quote, would naturally show traces of my expressions and even of my writing. But all the same, it would be a perfectly genuine occult phenomenon and a real message from the Mahatma, end quote. This in part was one of Besant's complaints about judges' Mahatma letters. What about Besson's concern with the handwriting style of the letter? Blavatsky indicates that um, in, the last, in the last excerpt, excuse me, that the chela may be actually writing the letter, so the handwriting may also differ. In a letter Blavatsky wrote to another recipient of Mahatmic messages, A.P. Sinet, during the 1880s, she commented on the different handwriting styles that uh, may occur in these letters. She writes, differences in handwriting? Oh, the great wonder. Has the Master Cage written himself all of his letters? How many chalas have been precipitating and writing them? Heaven only knows. Now, if there is such a marked difference between letters written by the same identical person mechanically, as the case with me, for instance, who never had a steady handwriting, how much more in precipitation, which is the photographic reproduction from one's head, and I bet that no one, no one chela, if masters can, is capable of precipitating his own handwriting twice in, uh, over in precisely the same way. A difference in a marked one there shall always be, as no painter can paint twice over the same likeness." End quote. Lastly, we should mention that Blavatsky, what, excuse me, what Blavatsky had to say about the content of the Mahatma letters and the use of the Mahatma's names on their messages. Here she entered in uh, enters into an area dealing with occult rules that may be hard for some to accept. In what is likely to complicate matters, Blavatsky made the following comment about the amanuensis, or the person transmitting the Mahatma's message. She says, it is very rarely that Mahatma Cage dictated verbatim, and when he did, there were, um, when, and when he did, excuse me, there remained the few sublime passages found in Mr. Sinnott's letters uh, from him. The rest, he would say, Write so-and-so, and the chela wrote often without knowing one word of English, as I am now made to write Hebrew and Greek and Latin, etc. Therefore, the only thing I can be reproached with, or reproach I am ever ready to bear, though I have not deserved it, having been simply the obedient and blind tool of our occult laws and regulations, is of having, one, used the Master's name when I thought my authority would go for naught, and when I sincerely believed um, acting agreeably to the master's intentions and for good reasons of the cause, and two, of having concealed that which the laws and regulations of my pledges did not permit me so far to reveal, and three, perhaps, again for the same reason of having insisted that such and such a note was from the master written in his own handwriting, 
all the same thinking Jesuit, Jesuitically, I confess. Well, it is written by his order and in his handwriting after all. Why shall I go and explain to those who do not and cannot understand the truth and perhaps only make matters worse? End quote. By Blavatsky's own count, there were a number of possible means to produce a Mahatma's message, including being given the authority to say things for the Mahatma that appear to include techniques that Besant criticized Judge of possibly using in his own letters. Secondly, I would like to talk about Judge's relationship with Catherine Tingley. While Judge's association with Catherine Tingley has been uh, given passing mention in histories of the society, the full extent of their relationship during his last few years has remained obscure. Tingley's elevation to become the next leader of Judge's Theosophical Society in America after his death may seem to the casual onlooker to have come out of nowhere since she was little known to most members. But in reality, after meeting Tingley, most likely in the early to mid, eight, in early to mid excuse me, 1893, Judge began to develop a strong occult relationship with her that was intentionally kept private from the majority of members except for a few of Judge's closest colleagues in the society's New York branch, the Aryan Theosophical Society. Keeping Tingley out of the Theosophical spotlight was based on paranormal orders received by Judge. Tingley, in her own way, shared Judge's dream of a renewed Western occultism that he expected would be established through the work of the Theosophical Society in the U.S. Prior to their meeting, Tingley was inspired to establish what she called schools of prevention that provided, quote, a new system of education for the prevention of the, conven of the conditions I met, such as poverty, crime, and other social cruelties, end quote. After meeting Judge, this new system of education would include higher philosophical goals that were evident in her revival of the Lost Mysteries of Antiquity program at the Point Loma Theosophical Community in the early 1900s. To fulfill their shared interests, Tingley assisted, excuse me, assisted Judge in two other ways according to testimony from Judge's closest colleagues. First, Tingley received Mahatmic messages for Judge, and secondly, Tingley may have played a part to recommend, but most certainly influenced, the American section's separation from the international headquarters of the society at Adyar. Both of these areas are interrelated, and they remain controversial topics for members to discuss. Since there, um, since there is the implication that she may have unduly influenced Judge, who was quite ill at the time. When the London theosophist Alice Leighton Clether wrote in the 1920s about her experiences in the society, she claimed that Catherine Tingley told her that she had dictated to Judge his famous November 3rd, 1894 circular, entitled By Master's Direction. This circular declared that black magicians were influencing Brahmin members to disrupt the society's true purpose initiated by Blavatsky, which was the inauguration of a renewed Western occultism. Claude Falls Wright, one of Judge's close colleagues in New York City, testified about Tingley's occult status in an 1896 EST circular supporting her as Judge's successors after Judge's death. In his statement, Wright referred to the November EST circular while noting one instance when Tingley was in a trance. Wright uh, continued, Quote, and Tingley told me much of the future, and particularly of the founding of a great school of occultism in the West, the revival of the ancient mysteries, which was afterwards embodied by W.Q. Judge in the EST circular of November 3, 1894, quote. If Wright does not state that she dictated the November EST circular, as Clether's testimony states many years later, he does indicate that she provided ample inspiration for its contents. Additionally, the German theosophist Franz Hartmann, who lived in America for a period of time, believed that Tingley received Mahatmic messages for Judge as well. Tingley states uh, this himself in, in letters and diaries, um, excuse me, Judge states this himself in, in letters and diaries uh, noted by another of Judge's close colleagues, uh, E.T. Hargrove, in the latter years of his life. Hargrove noted in the same EST circular containing right statements that Judge wrote down Mahatmic messages received through Tingley, quote, in the same way as he has entered his own as from Master, end quote. Other prominent members of Judge's EST Council verified Hargrove's statements in this circular. While Judge was on a lecture tour in January of 1895, 
he wrote a letter to Tingley suggesting that she, quote, put down briefly things that you get and not have them all lost, end quote. Judge was referring to her receiving messages from the Mahatma. Inspiration for the American section to separate itself from Adyar's administration may have been strongly influenced by Tingley as well. Another of Judge's close colleagues was E. A. Narasheimer, the treasurer of Judge's New York Lodge. On October the 5th, 1895, less than two months before the, uh, the meeting of the American delegates at the convention, Narasheimer received a Mahatmic message he said came through Tingley discussing how the section should resolve their struggle with Besant and Olcott. Quote, this course should be adopted at the convention. It cannot be avoided. If any time is wasted, much will be lost. A split should be declared uh, in such a way that it will leave the door open for the others when they wish to restore harmony. America must insist that it can no longer submit to this friction, intolerance, and untheosophical work." End quote. Whether this message was restating a course of action that was already being considered or issued a new command to Nerosheimer is uncertain based on this available excerpt. About a month prior to Nerosheimer receiving this letter, Tingley wrote another Mahatmic message for George Wright in Chicago along the same theme expressed in Nerosheimer's letter. The Mahatma addressed Wright's uh, doubts about the Mahatmas and the ongoing turmoil, and turmoil excuse me, in the society. He, he says, <clears throat> or excuse me, this is the quote from the Mahatma letter um, that he received. It says, that we do, you should know from intuition alone, as phenomena cannot prove it. But a crisis has now come, unforeseen by us, the masters, the important of which you do not know. The TS is in such a condition that there is no hope save in America. It has at last become a danger, menacing the real theosophical movement instead of a help to the cause. The duty of the American group is to cut off from the diseased parts so that itself can live." Uh, end quote. Tingley verified receiving this uh, last Mahatmic message in an EST circular that she wrote in September of 1896. Several other prominent theosophists besides Nerosheimer, such as Joseph Fussell, D. N. Dunlap, um, and D. N. Dunlap, excuse me, also testified that Tingley played a role in the decision to separate the American section from Adyar. Lastly, I'd like to discuss the autonomy uh, the, the, the issue of whether uh, the American section separated uh, was a form of autonomy, declaring its autonomy, or whether it was, it was a succession from the society. When the American section separated itself from the Adyar administration at the American Convention in April of 1895, Olcott soon labeled the act as a succession from the society. But other members disagreed with the president's view. This was made apparent in a statement published in the August 1895 edition of The Theosophist that said, quote, the action of the American section has been construed by both the president founder, the general secretary of the European section, who was G.R.S. Meade, Mrs. Besant and others as meaning succession from the T.S. Other members of the society do not take the same view, end quote. Instead, members supporting Judge saw the separation as the rightful act of declaring autonomy from the Adyar administration. The American members who followed Judge rewrote their constitution to become the new Theosophical Society in America. Judge claimed the separation was actually declaring these sections autonomy for two reasons. His distinction between the Theosophical Society and the Theosophical Movement um, and secondly, the parent Theosophical Society remained in New York City rather than following the President and Blavatsky when they moved to India in the 1880s. And I should say real quickly that the Theosophical Society in America that Judge founded is not the same Theosophical Society that exists today in Wheaton, Illinois. Those are two different organizations. So Judge believed that the Theosophical Movement was a spiritual impetus that underlies a number of possible efforts such as the current Theosophical Society. Judge qualified the movement as being, quote, moral, ethical, spiritual, universal, invisible, save in effect, and continuous, end quote. And the society he equated to a, quote, machine for conserving energy and putting the movement to use, end quote. Therefore, Judge believed the machine could be rebuilt to suit the needs of its members. 
Another group that Judge believed to be part of the Theosophical movement was Freemasonry, and he hoped that Theosophical sections would adopt the, th the Freemasonic organizational model after he separated from Adyar. Freemasons maintained independent lodges in each country, but each worked towards the same purpose independently. This desire, though, was not to come to pass. A more tangible and uh, legal argument was also made for the American section's separation. Judge believed that uh, the further development of the society's bylaws and the formation of additional sections of the society after Olcott and Blavatsky arrived in India in 1879 existed as a de facto condition and were no and there were no law and were excuse me not lawful according to the society's original constitution that resided in New York City. Judge asked several prominent members to write a historical overview that was read to the American Convention delegates to demonstrate that what was considered to be the actual development of the various sections in the movement. What members heard was a variation on the society's history than what they would have been reading in, Judge, in, in Olcott's serially published history of the society at that time in The Theosophist since 1892, known to us today as Old Diary Leaves. The American section's historical narrative, though, opened with Blavatsky and Olcott departing to India in the latter part of 1878. The pair had been appointed as a committee of the TS before leaving. Olcott and Blavatsky remained as a committee in India until October 1879 when a new body was formed on the subcontinent, calling itself the General Council of the Theosophical Society. This new council adopted revised rules of the, of the TS. Um, and this narrative's central argument revolved around their contention that the Constitution and bylaws were created and continue to reside in New York City. Any changes recommended by the bylaws or appointments of the councils had to be made at the headquarters where the Constitution and bylaws resided, which was in New York City. According to this rendition, there was no authority given to Olcott and Blavatsky as a designated committee to create a general council, let alone adopt revised rules, even if those elements remained in existence up to the present day. As a consequence of the American section's rendition of these early events, the establishment of the society's headquarters in India was really the formation of a separate society using the same name. This reasoning was justifiable since the historical narrative took pains to highlight how the formation of, a, of autonomous branches was already a natural feature within the movement, such as the London Lodge and the Simla Eclectic Theosophical Society. The American section's historical narrative wanted to show that all of the changes and permutations of the various theosophical groups around the world boiled down to de facto spontaneous growth. Because there were no election, appointment, or amendments made to the original bylaws, Judge and other prominent American leaders considered New York City to be the society's true headquarters that could grant further uh, growth to the original organization worldwide. The narrative also noted there were no bylaws from other theosophical groups that were submitted to the society's New York office by a general council. Therefore, the Theosophical Society founded in New York never had any existence, according to them, outside of the sections of branches in, Ameri uh, branches in America to whom it had been granting charters. As a consequence of these arguments, the New York headquarters never had an official connection with ADYAR, and Americans had the authority to declare their own autonomy as an organization. Well, President Olcott would rebut this argument by transcribing two documents in the Theosophists and Lucifer from the first minute book of the Society's Council kept in India. Olcott sought to demonstrate that the headquarters for the Mother Society did constitutionally reside at Adyar. The headquarters had been transferred from New York City to India because an amendment authorizing, excuse me, authorizing this was written on July 16, 1877. Judge, acting as recording secretary pro tem, signed the document along with the president's own signature. Olcott highlighted the salient portion of this document to make his point. Quote, on motion, it has been resolved that the headquarters of the society may be transferred by the president to any foreign country where he may be temporarily resided, and he may appoint any fellows in good standing to fulfill pro tempore either the executive offices as he may find it necessary for the transaction of business." End quote. This document not only allowed Olcott to transfer the society's headquarters to another country, 
He was also given the authority to form branch societies throughout the world, acting in an official capacity wherever he resided. In 1870, uh, excuse me, the 1877 amendment then stated that any bylaws, quote, in conflict with the provisions of the present resolutions are by unanimous vote of all present at this, the 1877 meeting, suspended, end quote. The suspension or repeal of bylaws that were inconsistent with resolutions made earlier was also noted in a second document issued as an amendment the following year, which Olcott also transcribed to rebut the American section's claims. Judge had also, been, uh, had also recorded this second document during a meeting in August 1878, but on this occasion, an A. Gustam, then acting as the secretary, who along with the president signed the document. The result of this subsequent meeting allowed the president to continue admitting new members into the society, even if the headquarters had been relocated to a foreign country. He was also allowed to continue making, quote, rules and regulations and do such things as he may consider necessary for the welfare of the society, end quote. In summing up his rebuttals to the American section, Olcott, Olcott's capacity to transfer the headquarters to another country, form new branches, allow new members into the society, fill any executive positions in each section as required, repeal bylaws made previous to the 1878 proceedings, and make new rules and regulations in the best interests of the society were carried out, he noted, without needing recourse to either council or society at that time. Olcott stated demonstratively, quote, no obligation was laid upon the president to report his actions or their results to the council or society of New York, end quote based on each of these two amendments. This was meant to strike at the heart society of the American section's active organization. The American section's historical repro uh, retrospective never referred to or mentioned these two amendments. Judge responded later to Olcott's reference to the society's early proceedings of these and these two documents, at least to his own members in America, through the pages of the Theosophical Forum. He released a short and terse list of disclaimers denouncing the legality of the amendments. Judge's tone reflected his legal opinion that Olcott was still remained in India as a member of a committee for the society. If these earlier documents allowed Olcott to do whatever he likes while away, they uh, did not allow him to transfer the society's headquarters out of New York for the following reasons. Quote, first, Judge said, the papers are illegal, mere, mere scribblings by himself and Mr. Judge in those old days. Secondly, there never was a quorum present at the meetings to draft the amendments. Thirdly, they, were not, uh, they are not in any book, as he says, for the original minute book of the TS is in New York City, uh, which it never left. Colonel Olcott wrote Mr. Judge not long ago asking him to send that minute book, end quote. And lastly, Judge opined that the circumstances surrounding the composition of these early amendments were not in accord with the society's jurisprudence and hence invalidating the legality of Olcott's defensive claims. While both of these documents state present and present, the president and a quorum, Judge claimed that the president had never asked for a, or called for a quorum in order to carry a, uh, out a, le a legitimate motion and then vote for each of the amendments being proposed. Yet given the young nature of the society at the time these documents were written, Judge also admitted that no one cared to call for quorums since the movement was so small and it was considered to have been in the hands of Blavatsky and her teachers inspired guidance. This attitude either justified or merely led to what Judge currently perceived as past officials' laissez-faire approach to the society's constitutional proceedings, which allowed for the current changes to be made by the American section. The editor of the English Theosophist, Debbie A. Bulmer, criticized the forum and judge indirectly about his statements concerning the minute book from which the two documents were taken. He reminded the forum that Olcott said the documents he reprinted came from the TS Council's proceedings kept separately in their own minute book at Adyar and not from any minute, minute book residing in New York City. The judge did not discuss his continued performance of official duties in accordance to the current Constitution and bylaws prior to this crisis, which set a precedent showing his section's adherence to comply with the General Counsel's decisions to reflect that are reflected in these two early documents. A number of questions can be asked about the rationale of the American section's claims due to this conflict between society leaders. For example, why did not Judge make his claim 
earlier for the validity of Olcott's 1877 and 1878 amendments so that the bylaws could have been amended to allow the president to fulfill his, fulfill his duties in India when relations between them were less contentious. In other words, would Judge have ever considered the need to suggest the invalidity of these documents had not this crisis occurred within the society? So in my closing remarks, I'd like to say that this discussion is not meant to be a final resolution or suggest the last word on each of these three issues presented. Additionally, there are other areas that also deserve attention in this contentious episode of the society's history that include Jean Chakravarti's relationship with Besant, including Judge's own relationship with Chakravarti as well. Judge's concept that the Theosophical Society was to express a renewed Western occultism or Besant's own views on the evolving state of the, of the society based on her experiences in India and later with Sinet's London Lodge. Or the role of Mahatmic messages in society leaders' decision-making process concerning societal policy. Or lastly, how members interpreted the bylaws of the society in order to defend their respective decisions on the society's management. The judge case is a rich area for historians to plumb, and my work certainly does not presume to be the last word on this subject. The more I researched this period, the more I decided that one of my, my primary reasons for writing about this period was to disengage this study from the existing apologies, justifications, or rationale made by the theosophical historians and leaders for the actions of their predecessors. And instead, I hope to encourage more critical discussions about the many issues and concerns raised by the events during this period that has uh, been su had such a profound effect on the movement.